happy to be here this evening and happy to have you here. Um, my topic, as you can see on the screen, is conversations as a methodology of interculturality, conflict transformation, healing, reconciliation, and healing. So, how does that go? The flow of the presentation will be into two parts. So the first part, I will give a little bit of theory, and the second part, I will go more into practical. The definition of terms, I won't define as, as if it's a definition from the dictionary. I will just give the understanding of how I understand it, so we have something we are working with. Interculturality for me, it presupposes cultures. There are cultures which are coming together. So we will see that part. And then the conflict transformation. Because if we are cultures living together, I can assure you conflict is inevitable. I can actually go as far as expecting conflict. And it's not a bad thing. The question comes is how do we go about it? And then the healing and reconciliation is an, in an intercultural setting, community, and I will share that from my own living experience. And then I will give, share a little bit about the conversation, how does it can be a tool for conflict transformation in the intercultural setting. And then some of the lessons learned just from the experience I have had in that. So to begin with the definition of terms, for me, there are so many definitions of culture. This is the one which appeals to me. Culture is the ideas, the customs, the social behaviors of a particular group of people or a society. So they are different. And as I said, intercultural, when we are talking of interculturality, it presupposes culture. So we hope that when we are talking of the intercultural living, there are some assumptions that we want to interact. There is interaction, there is in interchange, there is sharing, and we want to see that happening as if it's a family. So that's what we are working with. And the assumption is there is some kind of Communication. So what is that communication? We hope to understand one another and to be able to respect one another. And in that intercultural communication, what are we focusing on? We are focusing on the ideas, the cultural norms, the development to deepening our understanding of one another. And believe me, if we are into it, if we intentionally we put our work there, none of us will be left unchanged. Because when we rub shoulders with one another, eventually we will be transformed in one way or another. Whether we are aware of it or not, transformation does happen. So culture, one of the things I will say this evening, if you forget anything I say, go with this slide number four. And I will, at the end I will say go with the, end, the number four and the last slide if you forget anything else cultures. There are two sides of culture. There is an, the seen part which we see. You see Sia standing here, the way she dressed, you say, oh, that is from a certain part of the world. We see the music, we see the art, we see the food, the faith and behavior. That is the seen part. Some part, some other people use it, the ice, the tip of the iceberg, you know. The big part is in the water. What we are seeing on the surface is very tiny. It's the same with this one. The unseen part of the culture, we have attitudes, we have beliefs, we have values, we have norms, we have language. You know, language carries a lot. Even though you speak English or you speak Laysa Tagalog or you speak Kiswahili, still there is a lot underneath it. So that's why it is still in the part of unseen. The proverbs, the metaphors, 
and to be able to unravel that and understand what does that really mean. Their customs, their rituals. So that itself, that's actually what brings the tension. That actually what brings the conflict, if we are not aware of it. Because we are so many groups of people from different cultures, yet we want to dance together. The question is, how are we going to dance? Conflict. As I said, honestly expect it. But it's not a bad thing. If we're really honest and we, we put our energy there, it will transform us. It will bring growth. It will bring new life. So let's not be so much afraid of it. But if we continue pulling from one another, yes, our energy will be wasted and we'll never do anything constructive with it. It could be a conflict of resources, a conflict of even the common place, especially for us religious, who gets to use this common place, who, conflict of resource, who gets to use the car, who has the money pass, who, has, who goes more to vacation. There are so many things when it comes to that. So as I said, it's a normal part of life. Let's not be afraid of it, it's there. But the good news is how people deal with those differences, the one we saw in culture, the one, you say, is it a personality, is it a culture? No, they are all layers of this one person. So the difference, the way we, the, the way we deal with it, it will determine how long the conflict will last it can take a short time, it can take a long time. It's how we deal with it. I like this definition of conflict from Paul Lederach. He has done a lot of work in this area. So he said, conflict, transformation. I don't like the word management or resolution because we don't resolve it. If managing it, you can manage it, but really you don't want to manage. You want it to transform us. We want also to it to, to be transformed. Conflict is very dynamic. It has a life of its own. So even if you say, I'm going to avoid it, it will still operate. So he's saying that is the envisioning and responding to the ebb and the flow of our social, you know? In the social conflict as life-giving opportunities. That's what I like about it. As life-giving opportunities. So whenever conflict happens, whether it's between two people, between a group of people, it's calling us for an opportunity. The question for us is, are we creative enough? Are we constructive enough to increase our, the process of change, which will increase justice? Because we will look, there are some injustices there, that's why sometimes conflict happen. It can be perceived, it can be real. And also to be able to deal with the human relationship. Because the bottom line, we want to create our relationship. The bottom line, we want to foster those relationships. That's why we will do conflict transformation. And if we do conflict transformation well, it will bring us to the reconciliation. Because reconciliation is not an abstract um, topic or, or concept. It's real. They have been two relationships which break down. So these people are sitting together to work to mend this relationship. It's God's gift to the humanity. That is reconciliation. What does it do? It is not an abstract, as I said, it's very practical. It's a process of healing the damaged relationship. Because when conflict happen, something happened to our relationship. And why are we doing conflict transformation constructively? Because we want to mend those relationships. We want the heart which we feel to be acknowledged. Because when that happened, you feel that somebody noticed what happened to you, somebody cares. I like this quote from Brain Brown. And he has the whole book about that. He said that imperfections are not inadequate, which means we are, we have, we are imperfect, but those are not inadequate. Then what are they? They are reminders that we are all in this together. Sometimes I wonder, shall we go and sleep because we are imperfect and do nothing? No. We put our effort there, we try our best, but we remember that we are all in this together. None of us is perfect. 
I like this other quote here. This is my favorite, because when it comes to conflict, we need to remember this. We don't have to agree. At anything at all, we don't have to do that to really be kind to one another. We are called to be kind to one another, even when we disagree. Because we are still human. We still want to live with one another. Now, one of the things, now I'm going to the practical, and from my own experience, how do we deal with the conflict in those conversations? How do we create the conversation? How do we invite somebody in the conversation? It's important to create a safe space. Because when the safe space is there, make somebody feel safe. Feel safe to share. Feel safe to be able to be who she is or who he is. So one of the things I will say, it's very important in creating the safe space, is no confrontation. And when I was preparing this, I live with the two other sisters in Nairobi. One is from Vietnam, and then migrated to this country during the war, and another one is from this country. When I say no confrontation, they ask me, what do you mean? You mean in our work we don't have confrontation? I say, what I mean is that of coming into like a fight which makes somebody feel so fearful. Is that, so no confrontation doesn't mean that you don't question the other person. No confrontation doesn't mean that you don't disagree with the other person. But you create an environment in such a way that that person feels really respected. Because when I feel respected, then I can really feel myself. When you confront me, I can be so small. And then I create a defense. And then when we create this safe, safe space, we say, suspend your judgment. Human beings, we have judgment. I always say that even when you saw on the flyer that CRTM is going to speak, already there's judgment. It's a human. When I stood here even before I opened my mouth, you have judgment. When I open my mouth to speak, I'm speaking with an accent, and I say, is there any language without an accent? So, but when we sit down and now start having this conversation, we say, let's acknowledge this judgment which we have, we put them aside. Don't start looking for the answer before I, spe I, I finish speaking. So that's what we mean by suspend the judgment. Self-esteem, when you recognize that one of the person in the group, the self-esteem is low, Find a way of affirming his or her self-esteem. Because otherwise, he will never be able to share. Otherwise, she will never be able to share. Believe me, I know that part because I have been there at one point in my life. And sometimes I find myself there too. And then I have to encourage myself. Trust. Trust is not something which happens overnight. It's something which happens organically. So it takes time to build that, and it's necessary. Honest, we cannot force anybody to be honest, but the environment, the way we create it, will invite somebody to be honest. And don't tell somebody you are not being honest. How do you know? That's where that person is at that moment. The moment you tell me I'm not being honest, you mean you know more than what I know from my own experience. Acceptance, when we feel accepted, then we are able to share even the deep stuff. And believe me, it's a work. It's a work. And there are so many things goes into being accepted, especially in our religious communities. How do we create that environment that somebody feel really, I belong here? Commitment. Commitment here is really to stay the, through the process. Even at the hard times, you stay, you don't walk away. And we have to create this so that we are able to live together. Then confidentiality, what does that mean? When we share in the circle, you don't have a title, you don't have a right to go and tell this story of mine to somebody else. You can share the insights, you can share the lesson learned, but you don't go and say C, S, A, D, A, B, C in this meeting. So before we start, we have to create that environment so people feel safe, they can share whatever they want to share. Welcoming, yes, as I said, the environment has to be a welcoming environment. Now, intercultural living experience. From my own experience, it is a blessing as well as a challenge. Honestly, 
is two sides of the same coin. You cannot have a blessing without have challenge. You cannot have challenge without a blessing. So they go together. We are different. There are so many different cultures. We're talking of diversity. The values are different, as we saw in slide number four. The norms are different. The beliefs are different. So how do we live together then? How do we create an environment, you know? When we come into communication, verbal and non-verbal, in the verbal it's, I would say, <coughs> maybe 20%. The 80% is in the non-verbal. Because even the way I project my voice, especially when there is a conflict, it might be trembling. You need to be able to notice some variations and know that. You need to look at my body language and know something. And if that is possible, don't make a judgment. Ask the person, you know, I'm noticing this. Could you say something more? So be curious to find out. We need to talk much about the issue of power dynamic, power and the privilege. Because we all have a power, we all have a privilege, but it differs. It's different. So we need to acknowledge that and be aware of that. If we don't that, we are going, if we don't do that, we are going to abuse it. And then we need to have skills on conflict transformation. How? Just by continuing talking to one another and learning and sharing. Safe space, as I said, to have a meaningful conversation. If the space is not safe, the person is not going to share and the commitment to do our own inner work. This is very key for the inner work. Because we all have come with our cultural baggages. We have we, our culture of origin, our background is different. So there are some hearts we are carrying, and we need to continue doing our inner work. So it's both the work out here in the community and my own inner work. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we continue projecting to one another. It is necessary to really be aware of our cultures, that they have molded us for a long time. And if we expect the change, that change also will take a long time. Let's not be naive and want to do it overnight. But step by step, we'll get there. I like this quote from Scott Peck. He's saying that the key to community is acceptance. Because if we accept one another, we can celebrate our differences. And that is the key to the world peace. Because our small world, it's also part of this macro world. And then I will more and more say create a space where we can tell our life journey. Other people say where we can tell our story. We are all working books, so we can read that. Let every individual share, share their values, their beliefs. This is actually what three of us did. We work with a facilitator to share each one of us, our individual values, our individual beliefs, our life story, and then from there we were able to identify the group value. So the values of the group doesn't come from somewhere else. They have to be among what we value ourselves. And then the best part I like actually is to be able to ask each one of us, what does this value mean to you? Because if we say commitment, I value commitment, that's just a word. Concretely, how does that look like? Somebody said, for me, means I will be there on time in a meeting. So for me, I might say commitment for me is like I'm there. I might be late, but I'm there. So unless we start talking about those, we, you, you will start judging me using your value judgment. But when we talk about it, it's very important. How does that look like? For me, respect means if I use this kitchen, I will clean up because I'm respecting the other person who comes after me. It's as simple as I will flush the toilet when I use it. That is respect for me. So the other person, it might be different, but it's very important to create that space to be able to hear that. And so the most important and I always say difficult part of conflict is the identity-based conflict. It's, it's very challenging because it's dear. It's close to our core. And there is a lot of fear which goes on with it. What am I going to become? Or what am I losing? So we need to be able to be there to understand that. We need to be able to have conversations to hear those fears. Because the truth is, identity is not rigid. It keep on, it's not static. 
It's fluid, it keeps on changing in so many different ways. It's not a linear thing, but nobody remains unchanged. I love this part. The most critical part of the process are the cultivation of the internal self or intra-group space. Because you are talking of the inner to create that, we are safe and deep reflection about nature of the situation. Because we do have our situation. Responsibility, hopes, and fears can be pursued. Sometimes when conflict happens, we say, oh, it's about personality. But when you go deeper, there are some issues. Or maybe that is situation itself. So to be able as a group, the way I will do my own inner work is the same the group needs to be able to create a space to deal with that. And when you are able to do that, it's not, a, it's not something you say, yes, today I got it, that's it. It's a life journey. Every day we gain some wisdom, we gain some understanding, we, we gain some more knowledge, we, we go deeper. You don't, afraid, you, you don't fear conflict here anymore, you are part of it. So Conversations for Social Change is one of the program we have been doing for three of us in Nairobi for more than, myself I was in it for more than eight years until I went back to school. So I'm still, I'm, I'm studying theology at the moment. But we still practice it in our community because how it started, it started with us creating a safe space, having conversations, and then we took it out to the community. And what does it mean? It encouraged deep listening, 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 respect of each other's point of view. Because we all have a point of view. If we read one book in this room, we will all come up with different point of views from that one book, as many as we are different here. And also be able to cultivate that spirit of curiosity. Ask a question, be curious. Don't judge. So that's part of the things we learn. How do I elicit it from the other person so that I can learn more? Invite people to share from their personal experience. You know the beauty of personal experience is nobody can say that is not true. If it's really my personal experience, if it's true my personal experience, because I am the author. How can you tell me I didn't experience that if truly I experienced it? So we usually invite people to share from their personal experience. And from that space of sharing their stories, actually another person gets healed. Because when you hear from another person's story and what they have gone through, you realize actually it's possible. Yours is not impossible. So that's one of the lessons we have learned from that one that it's very important to be able to share that. It's very important to process the conflict when it happens instead of pushing it aside. Because as I said, it has a life of its own. It's dynamic. We commit ourselves to work with a facilitator twice a year. When we get so busy, we do once a year. But among ourselves, every week we, we have to sit at least for two hours to how was the week, what happened, to process what have happened. Because otherwise, if we accumulate it, we won't be able to handle it. And it's true what I, it's, it's like, even though it is not easy, but it helps to cl clarify things. It's very important to check the assumptions, because we make a lot of assumptions of one another. And then if, through that, we are able to deepen our understanding of one another. And that's the whole thing. Why do we have to have conversation? Self-awareness. If you ask me anything else, I will say self-awareness is self-awareness is self-awareness and the awareness of our own triggers. The beauty of the community is we are each other's teacher of what we do. Somebody will say something, it becomes a trigger for me. So I need to learn what are some of the triggers so that I don't get just hooked when somebody else is being herself or himself. Unless I have done my inner work and I continue doing my inner work, I will never know my trigger. So each time I continue blaming others, oh, you caused this, oh, you did this to me, which is not really true. We need to welcome different perceptions instead of ignoring them because we are so different. And when you, you give them space, then it's better. It helps to understand where they are rooted, where are they coming from. Go back to that 
number four, with the culture and all the complexity of it. And transformation requires a process of interaction. As Tony was saying, we need to encounter the other. If you interact, you will really encounter the other. You will discover something new. And that one will help us in our inner reflection. From the beginning, three of us, we agreed on creating the safe space. The beauty is when we plan ahead of time, when conflict happens, we can call one another into it. We have values, we call one another into it. We have our norms, we will call one another into it. When we don't have, when conflict happens, it's much easier to walk away. And in conclusion, I love this one. For me, for the community to happen, everybody has a contribution. Each one of us has a contribution, and none, no contribution which is better than the other. So we need to remember that. Community is made up of individuals. We all have gifts, we all have talent, we are bringing into it to make that community. Everyone's contribution matter, and it's very necessary. So even when you think the person is not contributing, be creative enough to be able to see his or her contribution, because he or she is contributing. Even if she's silent, she's contributing something. And we are responsible for creating the change we want to see and we desire in the community. Thank you very much. This is the end of my talk.